In this video, I'll be showing you 20 Python tips and tricks that let you write faster, better, and cleaner code. These are some of the reasons that people love Python, and I'm going to start us off right away with actually what's considered an Easter egg in the Python language, which is what happens when you import the module called this. When we run this, it actually brings up what's called the Zen of Python, which I would encourage you to read as we get into the next 19 tips and tricks. A quick disclaimer that these tips come in no particular order and random, more complex tips will be scattered throughout the video. Also, I'm going to be using Python version 3.7 for this entire video, so if anything's not working for you, make sure you're on that current version. I'll also be going very quickly, so don't feel bad if you need to pause or rewind the video to catch up with what I've done. And that leads us to the first tip here that I'm going to show, which is actually how to create an enum in Python. Now, this is more of a simulation than an actual enum, but what we can do is create a class, which is the name of the enum that we want. In this case, I've called it enum. And then we can list three variables beside each other. So in this case, I'm going to go Tim, Bill, Joe, and set that equal to the range function in Python. What this will do is allow Tim to be zero, Bill to be one, and Joe to be two. So range zero, one, two, all the way up to three, but not including three. If we wanted Tim to start at the number one, then what we could do obviously is change the range function to be one, four. This works just like in a for loop. If I want to access the variable in an enum, what I can do is do enum.tim like that. And obviously we can check for comparison with the value one and see that that is equal to true. This next trick I like to call multi-line assignment. Essentially, this is a property of Python that allows us to assign multiple variables in the same line with one equal sign. What you can do is you can do something like x comma y equals one comma four. And obviously now if we go ahead and decide to print out x, y, we can see that we get the values one, four. What we can also do with this obviously is have more variables. So something like x, y, z equals one, four, seven, uh, run that. There's nothing wrong with that. And then what we can actually do is use this to decompose things like tuples and lists. So if I have x, y, z, so three variables, and then I have three variables inside my tuple, so four, five, six, like that, we can decompose the tuple, so z is six, y is five, and x is four. This works the same with lists, if we do it like that, and we can see when we run that, there's no problem. This next trick is called f-strings, and it personally saves me a lot of time when dealing with strings. The program above we can see prints out hello my name is name and I'm eight years old. These are two different ways to do this just to show you the difference between an f string. So if we don't want to deal with string concatenation or using the commas inside of a print statement, what we can do is use an f string. So I'm going to say st is equal to and simply write the lowercase or uppercase letter, letter f. In this case, it doesn't matter. I'll write the lowercase letter f and I'm going to say hello, my name is and then inside of curly braces, I can actually embed a variable or an expression directly. So in this case, if I go ahead and print out the value of st, we can see that we get hello, my name is Tim. And of course, if I wanted to embed multiple variables, I would do multiple sets of curly braces like this. The nice thing is that I can actually add expressions directly inside of here. So I could add 10 to Tim's age. And then of course, what I can do is change this to an uppercase f and it makes no difference. So that is f strings. Note, these only work in version Python 3.6 and above. They are a more recent addition to the Python language. Now, many times in Python, when we're looping through lists, we want access to not only the index or the position in the list, but the element that's at that position as well. Now, the standard way to do that would be something like this for I in range, the line of X, print I, print XI, which gives us the index as well as the value at that index. Now, in Python, there's a way to avoid this. Just keep in mind what the output is here. So 0, 2, 1, 3, 2, 4, 3, 5. What we can actually do is rewrite this loop using what's called the enumerate function, which allows us to access the index and the element at the same time. So what I can do is actually say for I E, where E stands for element, in, in this case, enumerate X. And what I can do now is print I comma E, and we'll see we get the exact same output. So what enumerate does is essentially pair every element in our list with the corresponding index. So we can loop through and have I and E and access both of them directly from the for loop without having to do something ugly like X I and assigning that to a variable. This next trick is called the zip function, and it's extremely useful when we want to access elements from the same index from multiple lists. Look at this example here. We can see that we have a series of names, a series of ages, and then some different colors. Obviously, Tim is 19. His favorite color is blue. Bill 64, favorite color green. You get the point. That's how they correspond. And when we print this out with the for loop that we have, we get Tim 19 blue, Bill 64 red, Joe 34 green. That's great, but I don't like having to write names I, ages I, fave color I every time I want to access something. So what I can do is actually use something called zip. What the zip function does, and I'll start writing it here, is create pairs of elements from lists. So we can do the list representation of the zip of names, ages, and then in this case, fave underscore color, and have a look at what that is. 
So that's Tim 19 blue, Bill 64 red, Joe 34 green. So it creates tuples of pairs. Notice that 76 was omitted because the length of this list is longer than the minimum length of all of the lists that we passed in. So in this case, it was three, so we omitted 76. Now, of course, we can use zip to actually iterate through. So we can iterate through zip with a for loop. So we can do for, in this case, top, in and not range we'll just do zip then we can print out the top and you'll see we get those same tuples that we had before just on their own line so tim 19 blue bill 64 green joe 34 green i just messed that up but that's all right and of course what i could do as well is do name age color like that since this is a tuple that it's returning and then simply print out name age color and now we don't get that tuple we get tim 19 blue bill 64 red joe 34 green this next trick is called help and it's extremely useful for when you want to look up the documentation for specific modules, methods, classes, anything like that. So what I can actually do is go ahead and write the function help, simply put in some kind of object or class or something inside of here and run that on it. Now, if we go up here and we actually look at what we get, we can see we have help on list in module built-ins, and then it shows us all the documentation that's relevant to whatever object we put in here. Some things won't work inside of help, but most of them do. For example, we can even put something like a module inside of help, so we could import OS. And if we go ahead and get help on OS, it's gonna be quite long. Oops, if I don't accidentally create a new window. But if we scroll to the top, we will see that we have help on module OS, a name, a description, and all of the documentation that comes along with the module OS. This next trick is called the dir function, and it's extremely useful for when you wanna look at the attributes or methods of a specific object. So let's go ahead here and create a blank string called x, and let's run the dir function on this and see what output we actually get. So note, we do need to print the value because it simply returns a string, but we can do print dir x, and when we look here, we actually get, sorry, not a string, but a list of all of the attributes and methods that are associated with this object, which is a string. So we can see that we have something like index, is digit, is printable, all of those. And of course, we can run this on other things as well. So even like an integer like that, we will get abs add and, and you can see all of the hidden dunder methods of a specific object. I find this extremely useful when I want to import modules. So something like Q. So if I import Q and I want to look at Q dot Q, so I can do that. And I can see that this has Q size, empty, full, get. And now I don't need to actually go to the internet to look up what all of these attributes and methods are. This next trick is called list comprehensions. What I'm gonna to do to demonstrate them to you is just write some complex list comprehensions and you guys can kind of figure out exactly what they're doing. So essentially what a list comprehension allows us to do is populate a list within the definition of the list. So I can do something like i for i in range five, print the value of x down here, and we can see we get zero, one, two, three, four. Now this is a simple list comprehension where we simply have one element, we have an iterator here or a for loop, whatever it is, and then we have the element that just populates for every loop. Now, of course, I can add some if statements here as well. So I can do something like uh, I mod two equals equals zero, which means now we only get even numbers inside of our list. I could actually create nested lists if I wanted to. So I could actually do something like a list here. And instead of putting I, I can just do that. And now we get all these empty lists. I could populate the list myself like that. So zero one, or I can even put another for loop in here. So like four J, so we'll just do something J for J in range i this is kind of a cool one um oops not is just i so we get uh, blank zero zero one zero one two zero one two three so we can create some cool kind of iteration patterns like that of course we can use zip as well which is one that i like to showcase so i can do four i in range the zip of in here we'll do range five and then the range of actually 510. And then here, instead of just I, what we'll do is X, Y, and then we can make our own pair here of X, Y like that. When we print this out, we get 0, 5, 1, 6, 2, 7, 3, 8, 4, 9. Of course, we could just print X or just print Y if we wanted to. There we go, we get X, we get Y here. We could, of course, add another if statement at the end so that we filter these out. And that is kind of the basis of list comprehension. Now, since this is a good example for it, I'll show you the next trick, which is simply the anonymous variable. So we can see that up here we have X, but we're not actually using X in this context. So there's no point in really having this variable here. In fact, if anything, it's kind of just like, why is that there? We don't need it. It's not actually storing. We're not using that. So what we can do is replace that with what's called an underscore, which is just the anonymous variable.
variable. What that means is this is just simply a placeholder. It does not store anything. It doesn't get assigned anything. It's just here. We can't access it. I can't like print out the value of underscore and get a value. It's just here to say, hey, we don't want to put a value here, but I need to so I can access Y. So let's put it there. Now, the best example of when we should actually use this is something like this. So for underscore in range five print, let's say hello. The reason we do that is because again, this loop does not depend on the iterator variable. So we don't actually need to define it here. So we can just put in underscore. It just kind of common practice doesn't really matter if you put this or not, like you can put an I and it doesn't make a difference, but the underscore just looks a little bit cleaner and it tells whoever's reading your code that we do not rely on that iterator variable whatsoever. This next trick is called dot join. It's extremely useful when we have a list of words and we want to concatenate them into one string. Essentially, let's say we want to separate all these words by commas and add them into a string. What we would need to do is concatenate all of them, use a for loop, something like that. But if we have dot join, all we need to do is do something like this dot join words. Now, what this does is take all of these words and concatenate them with this string, whatever's on the left hand side here before this dot operator uh, as the separator. So if I run this, we can get hello, my name is Tim. If I decide to put a comma in here, we get hello, comma, my comma, name, comma is. And, you know, we can go ahead and keep doing that with any separator that we want. We can do two dashes. That is how dot join works. Pretty useful um, and a pretty just cool trick to know. This next one's a fast one, simply a way to reverse a string. Pretty easy. All you have to do is do the name of the string in this switch, which is st, and then colon, colon, negative one. What this does is use the slice operator to essentially create a new version of this string that is reversed version of this. So just note, this doesn't do this in place. This makes a new version of the string. That's why this works when I print it out. So that's cool. That's how you reverse a string. Nice, fast, easy shortcut. All right, time for another short one. This is a cool Easter egg in Python. Import underscore underscore hello underscore underscore. Run that, you see we get hello world. That was that trick. This next trick can be extremely useful. It actually tells us the amount of bytes that an object in Python takes up in memory. So what we can do is import SYS, which is a built-in module in Python. I believe that stands for system. And then what we can do is create some variable. So let's say something like x equals 100 and then print the SYS dot get size of and in this case X. So here we can see that gives us a size of 14 bytes to represent the integer 100. You'll just notice something interesting when I type hello, we get actually 30 bytes to represent that. If we want to create something like a list, let's do one, two, three, four, like that. That takes 52 bytes. So this is cool. You can check how many bytes any object in Python takes up in your program. Okay, so this next trick is pretty cool. It actually allows us to get the most frequent element from a list in one line using a few built in things in Python. So what we can actually do is print the max of the set of in this case x with the key equal to x dot count. Now what this does is say, okay, we'll pick the max element from this set. But what we're going to do is count that element from this list x every single time. So what you do for the key here is put a function. Note, this is a function. Typically x dot count has two brackets, but we just want to put the actual function itself. We don't want to put the two brackets. And what this will do is simply call x dot count with the value x, which is from the set of x and will return to us the maximum element based on that key. So with the max, you can actually make a key of whatever you want. Let's say you have pairs, right? So you have something like x equals in this case, like one, two, um, three, four, and you want to pick the maximum pair based Based on the second element, well then what you would have to do is use something called lambdas as the key and I'm going to show that in the next example. So let's just run this right now. We'll get rid of X and show you what this looks like. So uh, if we can just comment this one out, because we'll use it for the next one, we can run this and see that it gives us the most frequent element is one. If I delete a few of these ones here, uh, let's go like that. We see the most frequent element is two. Again, if I get rid of some of the twos, we can see that this broke because there's an S, but now we get four. Okay, now what I'm going to do is show you how we can use something called lambdas to essentially accomplish the same thing, pick the largest element from this list um, when these are pairs, right? So to do this, we're going to print out the max of x, so the maximum element from the list x, by using the key that is equal to lambda y colon, so not y u colon, y1. What this says is let's pick the maximum element from the list x. What we'll do is pass each element, which are going to be these pairs, right? So one, two, three, four, one, nine. So these pairs to this function, which is lambda y, which says, okay, this is an anonymous function that takes a parameter y, and then we'll return the y value at index one, which means we will sort these 
um, these pairs and pick the maximum one based on the furthest right element. Now, if we wanted to do it based on the first element, in this case, we get the middle pair, right? We could do zero. So if we look at this now, we get three, four, because three is the largest uh, first element. If we change this to one, we get one, nine, because we're looking at the furthest right element. Of course, this works if you have um, other pairs as well. So you have like eight and 10, we can do two. And now we'll pick this pair like that. And that is how you use Lambda as a key inside of the max function. This works for things like sorts and many other things as well. All right, so this next one is another Easter egg. This is actually what happens when you import the module called anti-gravity like that. Now this one is kind of cool. If you run this, it actually redirects you to a page. You saw my web browser pop up there that has a comic about Python. So you can go ahead and read through the comic. I'm not gonna do that, but again, a cool Easter egg and some nice things to see in the Python language. All right, so this next one is a little bit more practical. This is called string multiplication. Essentially, what we can do is multiply strings by integers in Python. So to do that, all we do is write something like a print statement, some string, the multiplication sign, and then multiply it by some integer, run, and we can see that what this does is simply concatenate that string to itself that many times. So if we go ahead and put a separator, like a hyphen there, we can see we get all of these things being concatenated together, separated by hyphens, because obviously that is what's at the end. We can add to this because this is going to be string. So we could do something like y u times, where's the asterisk, uh, 800. And now we get this massive string in the console and we can see that that works. And this is string multiplication. All right, so this last tip and trick is called the splat and unpack operator. A little bit complex to explain in the time frame that I'm going to go for, but I will show you a few examples and at least introduce you to it so you can go look it up and learn more about it. So essentially, the way that the splat and unpack operator works is it essentially takes a list, tuple, some collection, and unpacks it into keyword or regular arguments. Now, the way that we can do this, and a common example is doing something like star x in a print statement. What this does is simply print out each element of the list beside each other separated by space because what this unpack does when it precedes a list like this is it takes all the elements in the list and passes them as a parameter so the translation of this code would literally look like this print one two three four five because it just removes kind of the list and passes these each separated by commas now this is why you'll see this used quite often in functions something like uh, let's just call func and we'll do star args like that and then simply just print out the arguments now essentially what this means is we will take an unlimited amount of keyword arguments that's what star args stands for so if i go ahead and go func and i do like you know two three and then i print func or not print sorry just write the func of eight seven six if i could type properly like that and we run this we can see that we get two tuples this will take an unlimited amount of arcs now this operator actually works on dictionaries as well. So what I can do is use two um, stars and this will now mean that we will take an unlimited amount of what we call keyword arguments. So two stars means we are actually going to take a dictionary. We're going to decompose the key as the keyword and then we're going to take the value as the actual value that's passed for that keyword. So that's the same thing as writing something like define func, have a few positional arguments like that, like imagine those are x, one, two, three, and then we have something like y equals six, right? So it's actually defining the name of the argument itself and passing it in. Now I'll show you what I mean by that because I assume all of you are probably confused. I can do something like func two, three, and then I can actually say k equals zero, x equals eight, um, hey equals 10. And if I go ahead and now not just print args, but print quarks like that, we can see that it tells us this is k equals zero, x equals eight, uh, hey equals 10, and it treats this like a dictionary. Says the way that args and quarks work. Again, I know I'm sure most of you are confused by what I just showed here, so go ahead and look that up. I do have a video on my channel. But with that being said, this has been the 20 Python tips and tricks. If you guys learned something, if you enjoyed, make sure to leave a like, subscribe to the channel, and let me know what your favorite tip and trick was in the comments down below.